Hello, everyone, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Better the Pond podcast, the Flying V edition, where we talk to incredible people who are creating impact and ripples on the pond. My name is Warren Berry, and I'm your host and the founder of Instinctive Solutions, where we believe that everyone is an odd duck, but that is what makes them awesome. Now, today, my guest is Don Cooper. Don's immediate answer to every problem is, is there a better way? Don is always challenging the status quo, whether it is in Innovator Industrial Services or an Amplifier X. Don has always been an odd duck and thankfully he has because he gets to reduce workplace injuries by creating safe workspaces for his employees. He does this through his company culture for mental health and through physical health by using safe equipment and tools. Don's wise words are find what you love doing, then do it 10 times more. Thank you, Don, for making the pond not only better, but safer. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Cooper. Well, Mr. Don Cooper of Innovator Industrial Services, hailing from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, welcome to my Better the Pond podcast. It is absolutely great to have you today. Thanks for having me, Warren. I'm looking forward to uh, being part of the flock. <laughs> well played. You know, we were actually um, just uh, sort of reunited, I guess, down in Phoenix for the uh, the Colby Conference, and yep. uh, you were speaking there as well. So, uh, uh, so I thought, hey, you know what? Here's a guy who's making a difference. Here's a guy who's making an impact. I think what you're doing on the hiring process and whatnot in your company um, is really exceptional. So uh, we thought, you know, you'd be a perfect guest to get out here and talk about everything that you're doing uh in, in your world, shall we say? I'm thankful and humble to be here. You know, we, uh, you know, trying to make an impact on the on the kinds of people that I I want to be a hero to is, uh, you know, gives me uh, it's why I get up every day and it's why what it gives me purpose. So perfect. So before we jump in all the questions, Don, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about your company and what you do? Well, we've sure um, we've got sort of two businesses that when anyone looks at them, they think these don't seem like they fit together at all. Um, on the one hand, I've got a business called Innovator Industrial and Innovator, uh, you know, we're an industrial business. We, our focus is to create value through innovation by bringing innovation to clients. Uh, and the area that we're, we try to bring value is uh, inspecting, repairing, and modifying pressurized systems. And you know the kind of value we're trying to create is to help clients improve safety, improve productivity, and improve cost effectiveness. And in its simplest form, we help clients fix leaks. I mean, we 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 keep we keep the nasty high pressure, high temperature stuff inside the pipe so they can make oil and diesel and plastic and uh, and nuclear power. Uh, we we work in every industrial kind of industry uh, across the country, uh, doing that kind of stuff. Uh, and amplifier is a I, what what one of my coaches Dan Sullivan says is a strategic byproduct of great things we were doing inside of our business. And so amplifiers focus is to help uh, entrepreneurial companies grow faster and stronger by helping them grow their revenue, build strong teams, and they can digitize so they can scale. And those things seem very different, mm -hmm. but really what we do in Amplifier is we have spent, you know, more than a dozen years figuring out systems and the right people and the right processes to grow revenue, to build stronger teams, and to digitize our business. <clears throat> and we were doing it better than anybody else that we knew. And we we kind of looked at it and went, you know, we should help other people do this. And and that, but it was, it, it happened as a coincidence that, um, I, you know, I was focused on Innovator, but we had all these interesting internal costs that we thought, you know, we could help others with this. And we turned them into... Uh, into uh, another business that generates revenue and but it helps me fulfill my own my own purpose um you know i've kind of spent a lot of years trying to figure out what i care about and i care about eliminating injuries and using innovation uh in the industrial space and i care about entrepreneurs and salespeople, and i care about digitization i think all those things are a 
manifestation of you know what I of myself and what I care about. And so we've got these two businesses that are designed to help those two kind of groups of people. So when you said just what you just said, Don, I find it really interesting. I mean, you got two completely different sort of organizations doing two completely different things. Um, yes. And you know, and you say what gets you up in the morning with everything you just said, what is the common denominator that ties everything together? Well, we do. I mean, the things that, you know, I, first off, I think it's my purpose. I, I, I got this purpose that I have a, a short acronym for called 654. And it just helps me, uh, helps me figure out what are the things I focus on. And those are lifelong and lifelong developed passions uh, caring about innovation, uh, as an innovator and as a high quick start, I don't like anything that stays the same. I, I love change and I love creating change and trying to turn that from, you know, chaotic change into purposeful change is mm -hmm. what I love doing. Um, and so that's what innovator is all about. And specifically, um, I mean, I, I guess if I, if I step back for a moment, what, what connects all of these businesses and all the products and services that we have together is a fascination about how people take action and human behavior. I, I was a young, uh, I've always been an experimenter. My mother would say that I was a nightmare because I would, uh, I would tear things apart to figure out how they worked. Um, and I love figuring out how things work so that I can, you know, uh, one, it was a curiosity. I think I've I've got a deep curiosity. And but two, it's if I can figure out how something works, then I can probably figure out how to do one of two things: make it better, mm -hmm. or combine two things together to make something new. And and that's really the definition of innovation: is taking you know existing things, combining them together to make something new. I mean, that's what people like Steve Jobs did with Apple. He he didn't invent the MP3 player and he didn't invent the smartphone, but he took several things that already existed and made it into a better product. I'm no Steve Jobs, but I look at things from a, I would say an ideation standpoint and go, if I took this and I took this, I could create something new. And uh, for mo most of my life, that was, a, that's sort of a big uh, part of me. And I, you know, I think you, you and I are both initiating quick starts. And so that kind of comes in, in our gut, right? It's, it's, it's in our instincts. Um, but along the way, my whole life, in addition to that, I, I always like to do things differently. I always like to be an adventurous and explore. And I, I was always curious about how people acted and how people took action something you know and and who had grit and who didn't have grit to persevere and to carry things on and so i've been a lifelong student of figuring out how people best take action to move their lives along and and then observing that and learning that you can i, I was able to and i'm always learning about how do you how do you condense that down to figure out, you know, how do you get someone in their sweet spot so that mm -hmm. they can really be happy, they can be really successful, and they can be super productive? And, you know, that's the journey that I'm on is trying to figure people out so that I can help them. And it's and it's 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 um, it's something that fascinates me. And every time I get a new aha moment, I feel like I've had a great day. <laughs> Perfect. So you, you you sort of preempted where I want to take this next here, Don, because um, I want to I want to take you I want to take you back. So so here's the question, Don. What got you from being a Gosling? And now we talked earlier. So you're obviously you were from the East Coast. I want to talk. I want to go back to your very beginnings. Where did mm. Don Cooper start uh, to you know to leaving the nest when you had to go out on your own? You got kicked out of the nest and you're going to fly on your own to where you are today. So Don Cooper, what is your backstory? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, I I I I I started off, you know, as a kid, um, you know, normal childhood. You know, I would say middle class, probably more lower class, more lower middle class 
family. My parents sort of worked hard to uh, put food on the table for uh, myself and my my three siblings. And uh, but I you know, but we did normal things. I was in you know Cub Scouts and Beavers and Scouts and all that kind of stuff. And my parents were leaders. When I was uh, when I was thirteen, my father died suddenly. I'm gonna back up. I'm gonna back up that story just a little bit, Don. So we're gonna get we're gonna get to there, right? Yeah. Where where were you hatched? Where did you? I was hatched. Oh, I was hatched in uh, in uh, Saint John's, Newfoundland. Saint John's, yeah. Newfoundland. Yeah. There we go. Um, and um, mom, dad, any siblings? Yeah, yeah. I've got um, an older brother. Um, he's uh, six years older than me, and a younger brother who's four years younger than me. I'm right in the kind of in the middle. And I had an older sister. She was four years older than me, but uh, we lost her a couple years ago. Well, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Ten years, ten years ago. Okay, an older sister as well. All right. So those, so there were there was six of you in the house. And what did your dad do? Oh, dad, uh, dad, dad bounced around and and worked hard to at whatever he he could do. I think. Uh, I remember as a kid, he sold. He was a traveling candy salesman at one point, which was a which was a point in my life where I I was I I love that because he always brought home samples. Um, the last the last ten years of my dad's life, he uh, he was the loss prevention manager for Sears Canada, so he he took care of security for the main department stores, and he took care of um, uh, loss prevention with all the catalog stores. Oh, okay. And that was all within and in St. John's? Well, across the entire province of Newfoundland. Oh. So he, he traveled to a lot of these catalog stores and all of these small remote communities to uh, to uh, investigate losses, oh, okay. uh, AKA, a.k.a. fraud and theft. Yes. <laughs> he, was, he was the inspector. So, uh, and what did your mom do? Besides, My taking, mother, care of, besides taking care of the, you boys, but probably was a, that's a full-time job in and of itself. Yeah, my uh, my mom um, was well. She, you know, in in the last part of her career, she ran a dental office. Uh, you know, but her her fifty year career was taking care of people's teeth. She started mm. off in nineteen seventy two as a dental assistant and and uh, progressed up to uh, running that practice until she retired a couple of years ago. And uh, um, and we we just we just lost her um, in August. She just passed away. Okay. Um, so, so she took you, so your, your dad was, was trying to fight loss and your mother was trying to take care of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my mother, you know, the amazing thing about my mom is she was loved and admired by everyone because everyone in our community and all of the surrounding communities knew her because she was the lady who took care of everyone's teeth. Um, <laughs> And uh, and she knew everyone at uh, at her funeral in August. Um, the church was full of about five hundred people, but you know, in this day and age, they uh, they broadcast it on uh, Facebook Live for the church, and there was over thirty five hundred people watched her funeral live. Wow. And so, you know, can you imagine four thousand people wanting to s just see your send off? Wow, yeah. she was like the, she was like the queen. She was uh, she was a force to be reckoned with in the community. Uh, she she uh, she was loved by a lot of people, and uh, and every, everyone knew her. And um, uh, it's inspiring to I, I I thought about it at the time, going you know wow what a, what a life that that many people want to be there just to mm -hmm. say goodbye. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's very inspiring. So you you said earlier about your dad had had passed suddenly. You said you were how old were you when your dad passed? I, I was thirteen. You're thirteen. Yeah. And uh, so he passed suddenly. So that obviously must have left quite a a mark on the family. Yeah, I mean, it 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 really was a pivotal point in terms of total change, right? I mean, um, we went from this sort of stable structured family unit with his mom and dad and the kids to um you know after he he passed very suddenly it was unexpected uh my mother was 36 he was 40 wow. uh and she had uh a nine-year-old to a 19-year-old in the house and uh and f four children at 36 and now she's a widow and uh, she didn't cope very well for a couple years and so we all kind of had to figure out how to how to take care of ourselves. And, uh, it was, a, 
instantly to you know figure out how you move forward in the world and but it was you know it was it was just a, a total 180 change yeah absolutely uh a absolutely uh i would say for all of us a a touchstone traumatic moment mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah and do you do you feel that it really brought did it bring the family together or did it pull the family apart um i think with time it's it 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 helped us heal. Like it, we got back together, but it, it, I would say for the most part, at least from my experience, um, we all sort of dispersed somehow a lot and found our, instead of having a common direction as a family unit, we all had individual directions that quickly sort of showed themselves. My mother, uh, you know, struggled for a while and then found a new partner a couple of years later and moved, moved in that direction. Um, my brother, my my older brother and sister, very quickly. They were in their late teens, so they very quickly went on the post secondary and moved on their their, their lives. I became just ultra independent. There was there was really no mom or dad that said you can or can't do this. And I I would say, and that's for me, that was the you know a first domino in whether I became successful. Mm -hmm. and moved forward in a positive way or if I went to the dark side and and there was a year or two in that period from age because it was age 13 and a half till about age 14 and a half maybe 15 where I was on that fence of going to the dark side of of being a troublesome youth and fortunately I found an organization uh that really gave me some structure and gave me some great role models that uh that could guide me in a, in a direction that was you know i would say for me i'm thankful for to this day that, that they are foundational in my values and beliefs and that was uh that was the army cadets ah yeah i didn't i did not know that about you so you got so that so obviously yeah they gave you some some structure and some belonging to to something yeah, you know, and it's, I think it was a time when I didn't have any structure and discipline in my home life. Mm -hmm. So I had it in this cadet life and I, I looked up and they gave you, they gave you goals to achieve. There was things to accomplish. There was rank and file sort of status where I want to get promoted because of my, you know, my good work or my discipline or my capabilities. And so very quickly, it gave me something to work towards. And I had this set of officers that, you know, I admired and that I wanted to live up to their expectations. And they were really good at, you know, just just giving you guidance. And um, uh, I, 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 I can swear to this day that if I didn't have that organization, uh, I'm sure that I probably went would have went down a path of destruction. Right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, that's fascinating. So was that most of your teenage years? Were you involved with the cadets through that whole yeah. period? Yeah. Uh, from uh, from the from the point when uh, I I think I joined cadets because my brother, my older brother and sister were involved in it, and uh, and so I joined it a few months before my dad passed. And, uh, and so I went through it from there right up to basically age 19. And um, uh, literally, I think it was weeks before I got on, got on a plane and flew <laughs> to Alberta. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I've, obviously, I've been here, uh, I made Alberta my home uh, for the last 30, almost 31 years now. So this is the perfect phase in because that was the time when you left the nest. I left hey, the you, nest. You I left the I, nest. You and you literally flew. So this is perfect for the metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> and what brought you out to Edmonton, Alberta, Don? Uh, well, by that time I was um I was a uh, I had just finished my first year of university and uh I was going to be uh, I didn't, you know, I think I went to university because uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who said I should go to university. And uh, I think, you know, throughout my teens, I was going to be a police officer or I was going to join the army. Uh, you know, my my family never really had uh, an entrepreneurial um, mm. experience. They had jobs and they struggled, you know, to to uh, find jobs that paid. And so I never had that entrepreneurial sort of experience growing up. Um 
so I got, you know, I finished university and, and it was in the spring of 1992. What did and, you take Don? Uh, well, in Newfoundland, the first year of university is general studies. My intention when I was to become a lawyer, um, and, uh, and I was studying psychology and sociology and that's, you know, and it was really through cadets that I got inspired by understanding how people make decisions and how they take action mm -hmm. Okay, because you could follow in army cadets, you could follow two paths, you know, relative to, uh, you know, in the summer in army cadets, they ha always had these summer sort of in intensive training programs where you could go do a six week course and you'd, they'd fly you to a local cadet camp and you took leadership courses or survival courses and all that kind of stuff. And I always chose something that was different. Um, you know, if all of my peers went to the cadet leader program, I went into the pipe and drum band program and learned how to play bagpipes. Uh, you know, totally something, totally something out there. Right. Um, and each year throughout those summers, when I was a teenager, you know, you know, the majority, the the herd of all the cadets that I knew in my corps and all the cadet corps across the country would all go to some regional cadet camp and do the same training. But there was always the out these outlier programs. And I always went for the outlier programs. Um, so when all of my friends went to New Brunswick to the Gagetown military base, and there's a cadet camp there called Argonaut, they went to do cadet leader or cadet leader instructor. I went to the Yukon. <laughs> and and I hiked from Alaska, Skagway, Alaska, back to British Columbia over the glaciers when I was 15. And wow. then the, ne the next year, they all went back to New Brunswick. And I went to the Arctic Circle on Baffin Island and did Arctic survival training. Um, and then uh, the, the year after that, all of my friends went to, by that time, most, you know, I was 16 or 17. Most of my peers were then going to the local cadet camp in New Brunswick to be instructors. They were on staff at that point. And th that kind of didn't interest me too much. So I went and did Canadian Airborne parachute jump training with the Canadian Airborne Regiment. And, and so every year I went off and did something totally different. And I just thought that I was normal. I thought everyone else was weird. <laughs> but, but, you know, you know, after many years of under, you know, studying this stuff, like I'm the outlier and uh, I'm the one who likes to take risk. I'm the one who likes to do change. And now I understand why I never understood that, mm. uh, you know, throughout those years. I just thought that for me, it's normal. I like a challenge. I like something different. I don't want to be the same. And, um, and so that's, that led me to getting on that plane in in May of 1992, May 1st. Um, the the week prior, I had finished university, and um, uh, and I myself and a friend were driving around in his old 1981 Toyota Corolla that was rusting apart, mm -hmm. and driving around the city with a stack full of resumes, and the economy there at that point was wiped out it was terrible the, the oil industry had just started they were just starting to build the first uh hibernia platform but there really was no infrastructure no no industry yet and uh, that same week when i was looking for a job the federal fisheries minister came on to a news conference and shut down the entire east coast fishery i had nothing to do with the fishery i, I think at that point in my life i hadn't even been in a boat on the ocean um but all of a sudden, 40,000 other people in the province were looking for work. And um, after a week of trying to find a job, and you know, and I had been trying to find a summer job since January of that year in preparation for the, the semester break between terms and university, and there was nothing. And so on the fourth day, uh, where my parents lived was just on the north edge of St. John's in a small town called, called Torbay. And you had to drive by the St. John's airport to get to my mother's house. And so my friend was driving along and I said, you know, can you turn in here for a minute? And he said, for what? I said, just pull into the airport. And he pulled up to the front and, and, uh, and I, he pulled up in front of Canadian airlines, which is now merged, I think with air Canada, but back then there was Canadian airlines. Mm -hmm. And I put, we pulled up in front of the terminal and I ran inside to the front desk and I said to the 
the lady at the desk, I said, how much for a student standby ticket to Alberta? And she said, $385. And I said, here you go. And I gave her the $385 and I walked out with a plane ticket <clears throat> and jumped back in my friend Norman's car and drove back to my mother's house. He said, what was that all about? He said, I said, I'm going to Alberta. And he said, when? And I said, in about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and so, um, <laughs> my mother got home from work at five o'clock and she saw me in the kitchen with a duffel bag pack. And she said, where are you going? And I said, Alberta. And she said, when? And I said, well, it's in about an hour and a half. Gave her a hug and gave her a kiss. And uh, that was 31 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that's how I that's how I left the nest. I left the nest very suddenly. <laughs> very suddenly. You didn't get kicked out. You know, you 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 leapt. I just leapt out of the nest and said, okay, it's time for a new adventure. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know anyone really. Mm. And um, yeah. Wow. So what got you uh, sort of, you know, I'm going to bring it up to speed now is, you know, what got you into oil and gas and, and, you know, in the line of work that you're doing now, what took you in that direction? Uh, well, the, uh, the first, you know, when I, when I got to Alberta, I just, loved it i loved everything about the experience in that summer of 1992 and i and i think originally somewhere in my head i thought i was coming to alberta for the summer mm -hmm. and uh, you know but throughout that summer very quickly i just fell in love with the place and the opportunity and the people and and the weather um it was you know beautiful summers here not the winters are not that great but uh <laughs> you know but you know for five or six months a year it's a really beautiful place to be um at least from a from a summer weather point of view, um, and um, I I got a job that first summer you know you know doing parking lot maintenance. I was paving effectively, paving driveways and paving parking lots. And uh, uh, but through that, uh, through through getting to know a few people, I met a friend. He had a neighbor who was in the oil and gas industry. He saw something in me and thought, "Hey, I can get you a job," you know you know, with my, with my company. And I got a job on the tools as a technician. And um, uh, because I had, you know, uh, by that, by that point, I had two years of university and I had lots of computer skills, which was pretty rare. Then um, I kind of excelled through not just being able to be physically doing the work, but I could, you know, do the paperwork, I could do reports, I could do estimates. And so I, you know, I, I kind of, rose up pretty quickly to be able to do some things that other people couldn't do and um yeah and the kind of the rest is history i think i uh they 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 had started a new division uh that did uh, hydraulic bolting which was the newest innovation in the industrial space and you know anything new and shiny uh <laughs> was attracted to, to me, was attracted i was attracted to uh and and so I uh, I learned how to be a a technical bolting specialist and and I I started to uh, you know at about twenty age twenty or twenty one I uh, I started to be the on site specialist during maintenance turnarounds to do all the calculations for all the pipe fitters and boilermakers set up all the equipment and help them tighten large nuts and bolts so that you know that the piping would not leak when they started up and. Um, and that was sort of my journey into industrial innovation is looking at and very, you know, I could see as I'm standing there looking around, I could see how other parts, other other things fit together. And and so I just developed this eye for I wonder if we could do that better. I wonder if there's a new technology that could do that. And my journey over the last 30 years has been curiosity of is there a better way to cut is there a better way to grind is there a better way to weld can i take two or three of these things and mix them together and come up with something totally new and and innovative and um and that's been my journey is mm -hmm. is searching for and developing and deploying new innovation in the i guess the the, the broader niche of industrial specialty services that's interesting just to hear you, you know, to hear your backstory and listen to this. And, you know, you're saying about how do we make it better? You know, you're always trying to build a better mousetrap. 
Um, but you know, saying about you know how, how to combine, how to take two things, combine them, make them better. And what I'm hearing you say, which is really fascinating, is you're doing it in the sort of the oil and gas sector, reducing leaks and trying to create safety issues and those kind of things. But you're also doing the same thing with people. Is yes. you're, you know right? You're doing the exact same thing. You're just doing it and just in a different capacity. But really, the theme stays the same. Yeah, it's it's it is exactly that. I mean, that's that's I get it in my head. Like I understand how these things fit together. Mm -hmm. Not everyone else can see it because if they're not, you know, if they're not wired like I am, and a lot of people aren't, obviously, um, they don't see the connection between innovation in technology and innovation in people mm -hmm. that I do. But to me, they're just how do I make things better, and how do I make people's careers better? How do I make people you know i mean the the equivalency of a better mousetrap of a better way of doing things it for me is how do i help people have more successful and happier lives by getting them into a place where they're really productive they're really satisfied they're really motivated and and you know, and and across the same things that got me interested in innovation and technology got me fascinated and interested in people and how they act and behave you know and how do you how do you grab that harness it and do good with it is it, it to me is intriguing and you know i've i've got a story of the moment that i realized that you know that there is that that people you can have different cultures on this in the same environment and 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 a lot of people aren't aware of it unless you're looking for it. You know, again, I mentioned him earlier. My, my one of my coaches, Dan Sullivan, he says that the eyes only see and the ears only hear what the mind is looking for. Mm -hmm. And so my mind was looking for this stuff. Other people might not, so they don't see those connections. So I'm always looking at innovation in technology and innovation in people to create something better. Um, uh, I was, I was on this industrial job in 1994 and I was standing on a scaffold about 50 feet in the air in this pipe rack. And I could see from where I was, I could see this landscape of almost the entire site. And, um, I was young. I didn't really understand things like industrial safety and culture and practice at the time. I was just doing what I was told. I think I was 20, 21. Um, and I, I, on this site, we were in Northern, Northern British Columbia. And there were pipe fitters and welders and iron workers uh, demolishing this entire section of the industrial facility. This was a, this was a demolition job where they were tearing down a section of the facility that had been retired. And I'm watching, not knowing any better, and I'm seeing guys with grinders and with torches and they're cutting and they're, as they cut parts of the plant apart, they're dropping it to the ground. And it was what I would describe as rip and tear. You know, they were ripping and tearing this, this <laughs> facility apart and they were being highly productive. But where I was standing from my viewpoint, I could see the offices, the industrial offices for the management. And all of a sudden there was the doors open and there was eight or 10 of these people walked out and they all had white hard hats on and yellow vests and they were clearly management. And as they started to walk up the hill towards the site and, you know, obviously they were doing some sort of a management tour to look around at progress. And then all of a sudden I heard like some whistles throughout the, the, the site and things stopped. And all of the sudden people slowed down and they were using ropes and taglines to lower things. They were making sure that things were being done to a new level of safety. Mm -hmm. And and by this time, I had completed two years of university. And I had done a lot of courses on psychology and sociology. Certainly wasn't an expert in any of them yet, but I was certainly introduced to those concepts of human behavior. And I was just fascinated. I thought, wow, there's two things going on here. And, and at this point in time, from my vantage point, I'm the only one that can see that there are two very distinct cultures of how stuff gets done here. <laughs> and for me, in my journey of understanding people, 
that was the first domino for me. That was the first, you know, prior to that, I was intrigued by how I made choices to do adventurous and different things. Right. But it was that point in, in my life where I went, wow, there's something about culture and action that is very different here. There are two completely different stories. And I'm, you know, and I'm standing at 50 feet up and I can see this landscape and I can, and instantly I just saw there's two things happening here and no one else in the world seems to understand it like I do in this very moment. And, and that was my journey towards really studying and trying to figure out how do you, how do you understand this so that you can do good with it? Mm -hmm. And when I left that project, I enrolled in construction safety officer training so I could understand the safety programs that our industry were uh, were working under and and seeing if I could you know put my own spin on it my own my own approach to it and and so that was sort of that that that's where I started to to sort of pursue that angle. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna lean into a little bit of that in another question here. I'm gonna be, try to be a, a good steward of time here, so yes. we'll, we'll, we'll but we will we will tie this back in. Um, so Don, my next question to you is: what's the what's the biggest or the greatest thing that's happened to you that ruffled your feathers, that really got you going, and how did you respond to it? Well, you know, there's lots. Of, I've got lots of stories. I mean, we I think failure is the greatest learning, and. Uh, and so I've I've failed forward lots. Um, just throw COVID, you know. The I would say something that ruffled ruffled my feathers a lot over the pandemic, post pandemic, and and I, I had heard talk and stories about this of this great resignation, mm -hmm. and and equally about culture. And so about a year ago, I had a great resignation in my innovator company. I had three or four people who, who we had recognized throughout the pandemic were not good culture fits. They, they were not looking after the flock. They cared about themselves. They were trying to do things in a different direction that were not part of our plan. Um, but they were producers. They could get stuff done but they were getting stuff done by creating chaos and disruption for everybody else in the organization. And it really wasn't. And, and because, uh, you know, I had a general manager at the time who was concerned about if I deal with these people, it's going to do damage. And, you know, and I said to, I said to him, if you don't deal with them, it's going to cause more damage. <laughs> and so in the end they did what they, they, they quit the business, but they had been planning for three or four months to actually steal another 10 employees with them and to try to steal customers. And, uh, and so it, you know, I was able to deal with all that because what they were doing was illegal and we were able to, you know, uh, basically make that all go away, but it was very painful, very difficult. There was a lot of disruption, but the aftermath was that the company culture got way stronger that the company performance got way stronger, that uh, that the people in the organization saw that I believed in our values and our culture, and and we became a much tighter flock as a result. And and it was it was certainly a hellish thing to go through for several months. Mm -hmm. um, and I you know I don't wish that sort of disruption on anyone. You know, I think my my wife, you know, about a dozen times said, you just got to get out of this business. And I'm like, I can't get out of this business. This business is me. Um, but uh, but I, you know, I really it really was a great lesson that when you see things that that are not what you believe in, that are not part of your values, that you can't ignore them, that you can't let them, you know, you can't ride it out and see and hope that you can convince someone to believe something that they don't believe in. And, and so, you know, it really was a great, um, uh, a great reckoning moment in one part of my hiring process, which is attract people based on values. Hmm. Um, one thing that comes to mind here, Don, is, uh, you know, as you go through that, and I mean, it's obviously, it's very hard. And I mean, there's been a, you know, you, I'm sure you're not the only, you know, leader slash CEO to, to go through these kind of things. Um, 
how did you manage to, to keep your composure? How did you manage to keep it all together? Because I mean, it could be a, it would be a very, I can see it being a very emotional time. Mm -hmm. but you know how how well emotional decisions go so um how did you how did you manage to to keep it all together um in order to, to come out with a, a positive outcome uh i think it was grit you know um grit and belief you know and and, and quite frankly um you know though that that this happened right before christmas last year um and and, and early december and um I think that first, it, you know, and it was all very well orchestrated. They all quit on a third, one person quit at the end of the day on a Thursday. This was a member of my leadership team who was conspiring Ooh. and he he quit without notice. He said, I quit. I'm done. He walked out the door. And, and the next morning I, I was in the office at eight o'clock and then three more people all quit. And it was at that moment I realized that they had planned all this. Right. Um, and you know that you know that was triage that was literally trying to make sure that you could cut people off of systems to mitigate whatever you know theft of data and information and customer lists and whatnot but you know you know it, i i realized whatever they were going to take and steal they had already done it before they announced it mm -hmm. and and they cover their tracks relatively well not not well enough unfortunately for them for them but um you know, that night I went home and I cried in my wife's arms. Mm -hmm. um, I I was so not devastated, not worried about the business, not worried about the business. Uh, I I have gone through, you know, me leaving organizations and other leaving people leaving organizations to know that organizations move on. That they yes, they have ebb and flow. Um, I remember way back years ago, and I thought this was this was not necessarily a totally accurate statement he's but uh, but it does have credence that when someone leaves an organization you know if you want to understand its long term impact now its short term impact is, can be hurtful but its long term impact is you know put your fist in a bucket of water pull it out and see how long the hole lasts and mm -hmm. um, that's not my statement but i remember hearing that and went i wonder how that'll play out here and that's exactly how it played out not because those people weren't they weren't 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 good at what they did, mm -hmm. but because of the strength of the organization that remained, everyone rallied, everyone came together and filled in that hole very very quickly, um, you know. But I went home that first Friday night and I was I I cried because not because I was afraid for the organization, but because I felt betrayed, and I felt betrayed by a few of those people who. Uh, in our value system, you know, our number one core value is family first, and we take care of each other. We take care of our own, and I, I, I take action on that. I mean, one of the, one, you know, one, you know, for two of those individuals, one of them had their spouse leave them just as they had a child. My wife took all of our baby clothes and all of the all of our things that we had for our daughter, and literally delivered them to this lady and said, "We got your back." Mm -hmm. And, and another one of those individuals, um, he had gotten really, really sick six months earlier and was in the hospital with what looked like kidney failure. And I personally went to the grocery store and bought $400 worth of groceries and drove an hour and a half to deliver groceries and medicine um, to to his wife. And and we we that's that's not waving my flag. That's what our organization is about, is about taking care of each other. And we do it physically ourselves because we care about our family, our flock. And and I felt betrayed by a few of those individuals who we had gone above and beyond personally to do things for them and their family. Um, but but they kind of got led astray by one rogue agent. Mm -hmm. um, and and it was it was hurtful. Um, and how do you get through that? You know, part stubbornness, part grit. But I would say 99% of what got through me that what got me through that was watching the, all of the team that was still part of our family rally together and just hustle. They hustled to fix things. They hustled to figure out, you know, what was missing. What did these people do to potentially sabotage or hurt something? Mm -hmm. And very quickly, you know, they, the people who left became that fist that got pulled out of a bucket of water. And, uh, and 2022 became 
our best year that we've had in about five years be because of the strength of character and the strength of commitment of the people who are on the team. Which is going to lead me straight right directly. This is a great prelude, actually. You walked right to this next question is, you know, that, you know, geese fly 71% further and faster when flying in the V formation. We know that. Yep. Um, so what do you think, you know, it's how you're talking about your flock. I think this is fascinating. So what do you think the secret is to getting, you know, your team flying in the V formation? What do you think the secret was, uh, Don, that you, you know, that once we had the four people who had left the organization, what brought everybody else into that V formation? What was that secret? Well, one, you know, what was funny is those people, when they were here, were big, loud, gregacious voices of a subculture. Remember when I talked about that, you know, 1994, I could see the big picture and I could see two cultures? Yeah. Well, sometimes when you're the leader of the organization, if you don't stand up to the 50-foot level and see what's going on, you don't see that there's a subculture. In that moment, this, that subculture became very evident and it was removed. Um, but when we leaned in and we embraced the people who were still here and they started telling stories about the subculture that they had felt that was mm. hidden from me uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, we, we really gave people freedom to do things that they knew should have been done before they were blocked from doing good because of some, you know, this subculture that existed. And as we let people really be themselves and address and deal with things that needed to get fixed, they all just elevated themselves. They all, it was like they all got new energy because they weren't fighting a headwind. And uh, and the more we listened to them and the more that we helped them um, figure out those things and, you know, and really lean into a couple of things, you know, understanding, you know, everyone's unique capabilities and understanding what their instincts were, we were able to start to give them freedom to do the work the way that they would do it. And, and that was, that really just let people, you know, share that, share that load. And, um, you know, that, that's really unique ability and Colby instincts in play, even if it was a little bit I would say on un orchestrated, it happened in some chaos. Um, it it really spoke to the value of let people work to their strengths. So interesting enough, uh, there's a couple of different things that I'm thinking about as you say this is that you know the subculture was was resistance. The subculture was was a, was a headwind, right? And once the head, once you got rid of the resistance, they could all fly together easier and faster. Um, the other thing that's interesting is what I'm hearing is the the four people that left, um, you know, which we which we saw as a rather large problem at the time, became a blessing. Absolutely, you know, I I was I was hurt and angry and frustrated about it in the moment. Mm -hmm. It is the best thing that ever happened to our organization. It is the best. I look back on it with gratitude. I am thankful. Uh, and I'm thankful for our organization. I'm thankful for our people that, that, uh, and you know, and, you know, however you might interpret those people's actions, mm -hmm. I wish them the, the best as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they, I don't think they acted with integrity and with character and what they did, but you know, all that had to happen in, in any organization is that's why we have sort of these three elements of how we hire and how we recognize and reward. Do you believe what we believe, our values? Do you have the right instincts for the, for the role? And do you have the, you know, and what are your unique capabilities that really can make you, your skills that you can really use to lean into those to really make a big contribution? Those people had skills, no mm -hmm. question. They were skilled at what they did. And they certainly had instincts, but they were not a values fit. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, and that headwind was they did not believe what we believed. And and it was it was daunting to me to hear stories of the subculture after they left, where people came to me and said, you know, that leader, he said, I believe in those force four values, but that family first thing, I think that's bullshit. And, you know, 
and I and it literally like he said that out loud and no one told me and no one addressed it. Like mm -hmm. if you don't believe in our five core values, you shouldn't be here and you should go somewhere else. Not out of, not out of, out of frustration or out of disconnect, because this is not the right flock for you. This is not the right place for you to be right. We are working as a team and you want to be a lone eagle, right? You want right. to and, and go, go be your eagle because you're not one of our flock. We're trying to operate like a flock where we see strength in the team and you want to be a soul hunter, you know, a lone wolf. And you should go do that. And you didn't need to do damage to this or, or try to do damage to this organization to do that. You should have just gone on and been your natural self. Not a fit for our organization, uh, and so, you know, there were lots of great lessons in that that I really value and I, I really appreciate. And as I said, I'm I'm grateful for our, one of one of our um, common friends, uh, Shannon Waller, has a great mm -hmm. book called Multiplication by Subtraction. And that's exactly what happened in this situation is our business got multiple stronger because we removed some people who were just not a good fit for our organization. Right. Now, the buzzard in the flock of geese does not work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what are you doing right now, Don, to to better the pond? What ripples are you creating out there? Well, well you know, I mean, lots of cool innovation stuff. Um, we're really focused in, you know, on the industrial side. We're really focused on innovation that creates, you know, much safer workspaces. And so we have a series of new innovations that are all about what are, are called eliminating hot work, eliminating mm -hmm. using things that are that that have sparks and flame, you know, in live plant facilities that could lead that could lead to bad outcomes, even though they're normal habits. These are things doing hot work in industrial facilities, you know, welding, grinding, and, and cutting is common practice. It's been that way for d decades. But people don't know what's available, and they don't necessarily always know the full impact of what it what it takes to do hot work. And so we have a group of technologies that are all about helping clients avoid and eliminate hot work from, you know, believe it or not, sparkless grinders um, and ways to ways to connect piping uh, and do repairs that don't require welding, weldless flanges and, hmm. and a variety of really neat technologies oh. um, on the, and so those are all designed around improving safety, but you know, there's lots of tons of data out there that shows when you improve safety, you improve productivity. And when you improve safety and productivity, you naturally improve cost effectiveness. And those are the three objectives of what we're, the value we're trying to create for with innovators, improve safety, productivity, and cost effectiveness. And in, in, in our case, it's almost always innovation and technology or innovation and delivery that helps us find those three elements and a new way of doing things. Uh, on the people side, um, we have used um, behavior design and artificial intelligence to develop a new platform for a safety a safety system that helps frontline people use common safety tools that they use today, like toolbox meetings and behavior-based observations, but to give instant feedback to leaders and managers to see what's really going on by using um, basically handwriting recognition and digitization to instantly provide the data so that they can make better decisions to improve safety on the, on in the um, on work sites. Uh, that's through our, um, our our we're trying to reach zero injuries for five thousand companies, um, and and then finally you know with Amplifier is helping people hire better with with our countdown ability hiring process that that uh, you heard me speak about in Phoenix a few weeks ago, which is really about understanding your the core values of your business understanding the instincts of the role and understanding the unique skills that you want as opposed to just a job description that says i need a guy who can be a mechanic right i i'm looking for someone who believes what we believe who has these styles of instincts and who uh who brings these unique capabilities and the whole point of that is to attract people that that really feels like them and to repel people that go, yeah, I'm a mechanic, but I don't believe in those values, 
I don't have those instincts. That doesn't sound like me. And so that process of countdownability hiring is, is something I'm really passionate about because if you can attract awesome people who are a great fit, you know, a right fit for the role and a right fit for your business, one new person who is a great fit can have such a monumental difference to the performance of the organization and to the performance of the team that I think it's worth slow down hiring, slow it down, <laughs> right? Hire slow, fire, fire fast, fast, right? And, <laughs> you know, most people, you know, hire fast and fire slow. Yeah. And you got to flip the script on that. But most people don't know how to do it. All I'm trying to do is give them a structure. Mm -hmm. Here is here is the system for hiring slow and firing fast. And, you know, and it's an everyday struggle because I still have people in my own organization who have a gut check often because of maybe lack of experience and lack lack of time in being a hiring manager but they see a resume and they go i want to talk to that person oh he's the right person why because he can do the job he has the skills does he have the instincts does he have the right culture fit are you taking the, t the time to understand that and and that's that, you know, that countdown ability hiring, I really believe in it. I, I, I find that when it's applied well, it works really well. When it's applied mediocre, it still works better than, than hiring off of a resume. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so those are the three big focuses is eliminating hot work, improving safety and improving how people hire. I love that's, it. That's, you know, it's something you said that was really fascinating, goes back to the beginning of our conversation today. And you say, you know, when your when your dad passed away, uh, what the, happened with the family, and you know, and you had you you had the opportunity to kind of go rogue, you had the mm -hmm. opportunity to go down and and go into the dark side, um, and yet, but because you, you didn't have structure and whatnot, and yet what you did is you got into the more military who provided you a structure to follow so that you could grow, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about it? You're really doing the same thing now for business. Absolutely. Uh, as I said, you know, I think I said earlier that, you know, Gonzaga Army Cadets in St. John's, Newfoundland was that foundation of who I am today. Like I, I often go back and go that value, that belief is still ingrained in me. As a matter of fact, one of our core values in our business is called always growing up. You know, it's about always striving and how I describe it always growing, always better. And I say Semper Magis. Semper Magis in, is Latin for always better. That was the motto of Army of Gonzaga Army Cadets. And so, you know, right deep in my soul, there's a piece of that in there for sure, because I still carry it forward, you know, in the form of always better, always growing as one of our core values. And that came from from my time with 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 army cadets and I, yeah. i'm thankful for them and i have gratitude for how they gave me a better start than some of the uh the uh the trips that were going on or some of the the stumbles that were going on in my life at that time and uh also the opportunity to be a really an odd duck and go do your own thing <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely they gave me great opportunities that my parents certainly I mean my parents couldn't have afforded to send me to the arctic for six weeks or to send me to alaska for six weeks mm -hmm. it was the cadet organization that gave me those fantastic adventurous opportunities and and it really gave me a new perspective on places and people and 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 experiences that that, that i cherish to this day as a matter of fact right there on my wall is my is my airborne uh parachute military training cert certification and right behind me here is my uh, duke of edinburgh award duke of edinburgh award that i i went through the edinburgh award program in army cadets and in my office today they still hang on the wall because they are they're, they're cherished memories that's fantastic yeah. so in saying that um what is one lesson that you have learned don um that you would share with an entrepreneur starting a business today you know, I love entrepreneurs. It's one of my goals to help 5,000 of them over my lifetime reach their vision. And um, the, the, you know, and I've got one client today who, you know, he's a small organization. He's got seven or eight people and he is doing everything. Mm -hmm. He, he is 
what a lot of he is doing what a lot of entrepreneurs do, which is filling in all the gaps for their people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I leaned in, I said, well, what are you really great at? Well, he's really great at when he can get in front of a client, he can help them and he gets business. How much of your time do you spend in front of clients? Less than 1% of my time. <laughs> um, and I look at, you know, and I had him do an inventory of all the stuff he does. One minute he's doing payroll. The next minute he's writing a spec sheet for a project. The next minute he's writing ads. And so my advice is this, you know, when you make a decision that you're going to grow, that you're going to be an entrepreneur and not a solopreneur. And there's a difference, right? Mm -hmm. There's a very big difference between being a solo operator and deciding to be an entrepreneur where you're going to start to build a team build that team based on freeing you up to be your best self, you know, your best instincts, your best contribution to the business and hire people who do all the other stuff that you're not as awesome at. Most entrepreneurs do just the opposite. They start hiring people to do payroll or to do a website or to do whatever they do. And they become the gopher or the rescue. I mean, I, I call them, you know, I, I wrote a book called coaching your team and I, you know, from a leadership and management standpoint, from an entrepreneur standpoint, I said, there's sort of three ways that le young leaders and managers manifest themselves into not being their best self. And they become the chief problem solver where, you know, if they don't have good skills to understand their ability and, and to develop a team, all the people come to them and say, hey, what should I do next, boss? What should I do next, boss? And the boss takes pride and joy in telling them all mm -hmm. how to solve problems. That's the chief problem solver. Yeah. The other one is the rescuer. The rescuer is the one who jumps into everyone else's department to fix things for them. And he, you know, he, he, he's the, you know, he takes pride in being the ambulance driver in the business. Right. Um, and then the other one is the super doer, which is look at all, you know, I'll do your job 10 times better than you. You just watch what I do and do what I do. And, and I would say all of that are all sort of traits of, entrepreneurs and young leaders and managers who don't know how to let go and for them to let themselves be their best self and hire people to do everything else not because that stuff sucks but because you're going to hire someone to do payroll or your website or to do you know accounting because they love doing it and they're 10 times better than you so as an entrepreneur, my best advice to you for when you go from one to two people, the first person you hire, spot something that you really suck at, your, your weaknesses, and hire someone that th your weaknesses are their greatest contribution to your business, and you will grow fast and do that every single time you hire, um, and you will grow exponentially. And, and, and that's, that's true of every organization. And so even if you're not an entrepreneur, if, if you are in a more corporate structure, but you are a hiring manager who's trying to build a team, don't hire people who are less than you at doing their job. Hire people who are better than you at doing the job that you're hiring them for. And you'll, you, will, you will scale and grow and, and find success way faster. Absolutely. Find your who's. Find your who's yep. and lean in with great instincts and great abilities and be, and, and find confidence. You got to have confidence in yourself that I'm going to hire people who are better than me right. at doing the things that I don't, that I'm not great at doing. And, and it, it will be a game changer in your organization. I've got several of my amplifier clients today who are not leaning into being their best self because they're trying to, they're trying to be the gopher and fill in all the little bits of holes in the business and and not really contributing to the business in the best way that they can as leaders. Yeah, and they they're getting in their own way and they can't see it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I have one last question here for you, Don. Um so my question is if you were standing on the top of a mountain, uh-huh, and the whole world is intently listening to you, what would you say? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I uh I don't know. Um I would say figure out what you love doing and do 10 times more of it. I love it. I'm writing that down. Figure out what you love doing. I, I say it to my kids all the time. I don't care what your passion is. If you can, if you can, if you can figure out your passion and you can turn that into your career, you'll never work a day in your life.
Right. Why don't you love doing and do it 10 times more? Yeah. That's sage advice. Fantastic. So, Don, I really want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank you for your stories. This is absolutely fantastic. I love what you're doing. And, and I really um, I'm, I really admire the fact, I mean, how values driven you are um, and really understanding people's instincts and putting the right people you know, in the right place to, to create that V formation. Um, I, mean, I love that you're, you're leading that way. And it obviously it's paying off in spades. Um, if anybody wants to find you, Don, where do they go to find you? Uh, you can go to either of our websites, um, innovatorind.com or amplifierx.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Don Cooper on LinkedIn. Um, I've got, a, that's probably my primary large social presence or uh they can email me at uh don at innovator ind.com or don at amplifierx.com and that's where they find you well we will definitely push them your way and uh you know when again going back to the beginning of our conversation is what i so when i heard you speak in phoenix it was really interesting when you talked about you know your hiring process and, and doing video and those kind of things it was really it was really fascinating so i think that you know my listeners would really benefit from uh from listening to what you have to say and you know how we how you're building your teams and how you're building your company uh, i appreciate it you know and you know i think us colby consultants were a flock and uh, you know i was happy to contribute my little bit of uh insight in terms of my experience equally i was in your talk and it really opened my eyes to uh to leveraging uh, you know some of the some of those tools in a different way with b's and c's so i uh, I'm, I'm i'm about to do that for my entire organization uh in january when i come back from free days so perfect excellent well, there you have it, folks. It was a great time here with uh, our good friend Don. And uh, this is Warren Berry, and I'm flocking off to take you beyond the pond to better the pond because we're better together. Thank you so much, Don. My pleasure, pal. I'll see you uh, as the flock flies to Phoenix next time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>